Keith Pascoe, thank you very much for joining me ahead of your upcoming recital with the Vanborough and assorted guests, I believe will be with you as well. Um, I want to start by asking you, how has the pandemic been? When was the last time you played in public? Well, nice to see you, David, as well. And um, I, the last time I played, actually, we've been in a couple of concerts. Uh, obviously not live to a live audience, but we recorded them. Um, one in the concert hall and a couple in Cork, actually, in UCC and one in um, the Trisco. So, yeah, we've been doing a few things uh, kind of just filmed for broadcast and, and, you know, making it seem as if it's live. Well, I suppose a bit like today, really. <laughs> What's it like? Like, I mean, I know what it's like because I've done a few things myself, but like from your point of view, well, I think have you found it? It's funny how you get used to things very quickly, even, you know, that uh, are a bit bizarre. But for me, the strange thing is it's the breathing thing, obviously. I don't know, you know, it's, you think, well, playing the violin, you don't have to breathe, but you do actually. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, but the other thing I discovered is this thing which is peculiar to the violin, which is that your mask is here, and then you can't you can't actually see your bridge. So you're placing the bow onto the violin, and it goes crashing onto the you know the the, the bridge instead of the you know in between the bridge. Um, but the viola players find that easy because obviously it's stretched out more. They can actually see more. The violin is quite it's really kind of tricky to get used to, especially if you want to play quietly near the bridge. <laughs> so there's that issue to cope with. Um, apart from that, it's, it, it's a strange feeling of it. You feel slightly anonymous when you're playing. And that's probably a good thing. I, I think masks are like that, aren't they? If you can imagine going to, if you ever been to a sort of a party with masks, it's just great fun. Everyone puts on a stupid mask and then you become a completely different person altogether. And I think there's a part of that in, in this idea of wearing masks in a concert. You are kind of half covered, so people don't really know who you are. <laughs> I think there is that aspect, yeah. That's interesting, because they're like, you know, all, most musicians, in fact, all musicians, I'm sure, no matter what they play, they kind of go to a place, they kind of disappear, they move to a place when they make music, whether it be like in rehearsal or at home or even in public, you know. So in a weird way, do you think like the mask or the anonymity of the mask or the fact there's no audience in front of you, that's kind of made, because chamber music in itself, you know, when you look at its history is kind of associated with private music making or domesticated music <coughs> making, not so public, you know. So do you think that, you know, in a strange way, the protocols around COVID have maybe given you maybe a new impetus to go even more inside yourself and more into the music? Is I think that you're probably right, actually. Funny enough, I feel less sort of nerves involved in performing, as if you're hiding behind the mask. So uh, there is that aspect, I think, which is actually you know, the state we want to be in anyway, which is like this kind of zone, if you want, to get into, which, you know, takes depends on you know, how you feel on the day, <laughs> how long it takes you to get into that zone. You know, sometimes it's immediately and sometimes it's like oh god i feel naked what's going on <laughs> yeah that's interesting and like just sticking with the pandemic as well like what things beyond music kept you going over the past <clears throat> since the pandemic like, oh the well crazy things like um learning a language like i'm i've been learning arabic <laughs> Wow. Completely for no reason at all, except that it's, except that it's there. It's there and it's decipherable. You know, it's like, it's like music. You, you have to figure out what each of those symbols That's means. Fantastic. So, you know, the Duolingo thing, the app, yes. which is it's excellent. Like, I've been, I've been itself, studying yeah. Arabic uh, on a daily basis. So it's uh, fascinating. Have really. you anyone to practice on? No. <laughs> so God knows what you're coming out with. <laughs> You just have this voice comes up, you know, on the app, and it's. Uh, and is there any like looking back at your career? Are there any times you've kind of had? There was times when I really could have done with a little bit of Arabic in my repertoire no. of things. No. So did you know? Actually, the funny thing was, I went to the Middle East about two years ago. That was the year before lockdown. Yes, um, I went to Oman. You told me that actually. I yeah, I before, went yeah. just for a couple of weeks, and uh, it was fantastic. But no, no use for it at all whatsoever. That's brilliant. I love it. Listen, Keith. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your early years. You uh, were born in Liverpool and you grew up there in the 60s. What was that like? <coughs> that must have been an amazing time. I mean, grim. I quite, it, it was, was grim. grim. Yeah. yeah, it was all in black and white. 
And um, I was looking at some old photos, actually, the other day. And that's another thing you do, isn't it? When you're in lockdown, course, you look true. through old photos, and you're going, oh, my God, who's that? Um, yeah, so Liverpool in the 60s, yeah, black and white. It, it, because we look at our past, not like today, where we can just look at images on, you know, on the computer or whatever, we, we had to have physical uh, documents, which you have to get out of a box now and dust them, and, and they're all in black and white. So my, my child is black and white, 60s, grim, post-war. You know, Liverpool was bombed a lot. Yes. You know, our, our, the house we lived in when I was about five or six, <clears throat> just at the end of the road was a big site. We called it the Bondi, because it was that's where the, that's where the bombs landed, and you know, places were destroyed. It's like so, so it was still there in the 60s. You okay, know. Uh -huh. that's people don't think people 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 younger people don't think about that that the war, even though it finished 1945. Yeah. Its legacy went on for many, many years afterwards. Yeah. You know, the visual impact of it. Absolutely. And even as a child, I used to think the war was like centuries before. But of course, yeah. that, I suddenly realized it was only like uh, 15 years before I was born. You know, it was. It was, it was, uh, yeah. That's true. Uh, <clears throat> and um, how come the violin? What happened? Um, just complete ch chance, just seeing a violin in a music shop, in a local music shop. Really? And going, what one of those? <laughs> and like, was there any music at home? Were you no, aware? No, no, no. No, from very working class uh, home life. Um, and my mother was a hospital cleaner. Um, my father um, was a factory worker. So. Wow. Yeah. So you've no, do you have any idea with the music? Like, what makes you? Like, I'm curious now because I grew up in a house with no music either. Like, what makes you point the violin? I want one of them. Like, I have what no is idea. That? Where does that come from? I have no idea at all. I still have no idea why. And um, from the same place you decided to learn Arabic. <laughs> Maybe just curiosity, <laughs> curiosity. Yeah. yeah, curiosity. Uh, you study with the great Czech violinist and pedagogue uh, Yaroslav Vanacek. What was that like? Oh, that was amazing. I think that was really. He was probably the most important teacher in my life. Um, for many people as well. For many people, yeah. especially in, in Dublin, actually. Yes, hugely important here. <laughs> Which uh, I didn't realise until I came to live in Ireland, you know, over 20 years ago now. Um, but uh, he had begun his career in the West, in Dublin. Um, kind of by chance, I think, like in the, in the late 1940s, wasn't there a coup d'etat in Yeah, well, there was a, the Russians were going to invade. Well, yes. And I think lots of people left then, and he... Came to, to Dublin. He gave yeah. quite an important recital at the RDS in 1947, I believe. Really? And, and I think he stayed after that. That was what. Oh, he, that was so it. So he, he kind of in 1948 at that time because I think he was offered a position in 1948. But yeah. well, how did you? When did you first study with him? In London, yeah. Okay. So I I studied with him in London, um, and yeah, he was very dogmatic as a teacher. But I mean, he people here will I still meet people who studied with him in Dublin I can and I think most of the symphony orchestra was made up the violins I read an article <laughs> and the others there was 15 the others. players in the first violins of the RT symphony orchestra yeah. were his students yeah and in violas as well I the think. violas it was five I think okay. it was, yeah, he, like, he extraordinary had a huge it? impact on symphonic music here in yeah. Ireland actually yeah uh, so what do you what do you remember what are your recollections of him as a teacher as a person very dogmatic um, and yet sort of soft-centred, but very old school. He would write in biro on your music, you know, which was a very almost violent thing to do <laughs> to true. someone. Yeah. Imagine getting away with that now, writing in red ink or something. Why is that? Like, explain for non-musicians why that's a thing. Because I, I, even when you say the word he wrote in biro, yeah. I still, I go like, yeah. like that. I kind of, oh my God. But he used different colours. So it was you know, red, green or blue and... Um, because I suppose it's a statement saying that this is it. You cannot yeah. erase this. This is the fingering you will, you will use. This is the bowing you will use. It's there. And you can't erase it. <laughs> but why is that an issue? I know why. I think that's an right. issue. So. It's, it, it, it's an issue because he would give you two options. There would be an above fingering, a below fingering. The below fingering was if you really couldn't do the above fingering, then you just do. And he had two choices, usually. And after that, nah, no, no, you had to do it his way uh, or no way. You know, so it was it was a, it was a very dogmatic way of teaching, and there was always a reason behind his fingers. There was always a reason for everything. So, uh, 
I, I think it was about just making sure that you knew who was boss and that, that was he knew better than you. And uh, so you better just, you know, learn it. <laughs> Interesting. So you teach now, Yeah. Uh, I believe, both in Cork and in Dublin. No, just in Dublin. Just in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so is there, like, are there any aspects of his teaching that you have nowadays? Like, is, does, 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 does his method still live in, in you? Yeah, in I think today? it's inevitable, I suppose, as teachers, yeah. Um, funny enough, a student a couple of years ago came in with a copy she'd got from the library in Rathmines, and, and it was his, his ink was all over, over the copy of the Lalo Symphony Espanol. Wow. And um, I, I actually did a double take. I said, where did you get this music? It's like, it was, and it felt very spooky. Like he was in the room with us. The, this, this because just to clarify for viewers yes. that he did teach not only in the Royal Irish <laughs> Academy, but also in the College of Music as well. That's right. And that music, sheet music, probably found its way into the library of DIT, yes. or TUD. Yeah. And, it's, and exactly. so many years later. And, and it was, he actually taught in that same building. That I, yeah. So it was a very strange moment because it was this, this kind of... The hand of history. Yes, yeah, spooky yeah. moment. And it took me a while to kind of compose myself. Like, this is just amazing. Um, anyway, she, she, she loved the idea that um, <laughs> my teacher's music was in front of her. I think that was a really very special moment. Funny. Yeah. I can feel that myself even just listening to you now. Uh, you also studied... This is really a question, really personal for me. I want to ask you this question. I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> I want to ask you this question. You also studied conducting with Norman Del Mar. <gasps> yes. And tell me about that, because I'm fascinated by that. Oh, Norman was a fabulously funny man. He's a typical sort of bumbling Englishman, you know, very yes. posh. Very posh. Very posh accent. And, uh, but he'd come up with very funny things, and he was eccentric. Um, so he would, he would say things like, my favourite one, I still use this, with my amateur orchestra in Cork, uh, or sometimes in quartet rehearsals. You know, you, as a conductor, you know, you know figure 39, uh, blah, blah. So he, he used to say this for a laugh. He used to say, 39 is 40, and 41 is 42. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, just for the viewers, that means, you know, a bar 39 is going to be loud, which is forte, and a bar... 41, it's going to be loud also. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's say things like that. And, um, but I remember the, 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 um, the things he said to me, like he said, Keith, you look as if you're digging beans from a tin. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, this type of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he was probably, like, it seems to me he was part of a generation of conductors who had words that we all those phrases, like, you know, Thomas Beach in particular, I think, yeah. who has endless amounts of quotes, like, you look like you're doing this, you look like you're doing this, you know? <laughs> yes. It seems to be a typically English thing. Is there a school of English conducting that he, do you think that he championed? I think so, yeah. I think Beecham would have been one of his heroes, I'd say. Didn't Beecham appoint him yeah, he, as assistant, uh, yeah? But he didn't, he oh. play in Beecham's, yes, he did. He did he play French horn in Beecham's Orchestra. Yes, yeah, 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 that's yeah, right, yeah. yes. And he used to collect, collect apart from a massive library of scores, um, Monopoly sets. Monopoly sets. He was obsessed with Monopoly. So he had them in every single language you could find <laughs> under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> thinking of Irish, like, would you get Monopoly in Irish? Yeah, you so. probably can. You can probably get it, actually. <laughs> yeah. And later on, like in the early 1980s, you were a founding member and leader of the Chamber Orchestra of Europe. Yeah. That must have been an amazing time because the Chamber Orchestra of Europe grew out of the European Community Youth Orchestra. That's right. And yeah. So that must have been a fantastic time. It was a very exciting time um, because I suppose we'd all been together in the, U the youth, European Youth Orchestra mm. and at the time it was only nine countries, I think, uh, were in it. Um, and we would play for, you know, people like Carrie-Anne, Nabado, uh, and then a group uh, within the orchestra said, let's, let's, you know, when we get kicked out of this, let's form our own carry-on, you know, carry-on, carry carry <laughs> our carry-on orchestra. <laughs> and um, so that was what happened, and they were fortunate to find a really good businessman who still runs it, actually, I think. 
uh, who really helped set the th whole thing up. And that was <coughs> from the start, it was so the very first concert. Um, there were two conductors actually. It was James Judge in the first half, and then it was Abado, who raced over from the Barbican. He was just conducting the LSO, and he just raced over to conduct the second half. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, of the concert. And um, so it went on from there, from then on. But it was just at that time that I was uh, offered my job in the London Philharmonic. Yes. So it was a you know, no-brainer, really, because you know, did I want to stay with a, a fledgling orchestra, youth orchestra, or did I want to join a grown-up, you know, established symphony? So it was, for me, it wasn't a difficult choice. I, I had to go for the, the London Phil. So, um, so you're like, this is like, the early 1980s now, and you're in your kind of early to mid 20s now, and you're kind of looking at. You obviously had lots of different talents, different areas. Obviously, chamber music is a thing for you, and yeah. solo playing, leading orchestras, looking at interested in conducting and directing and that type of thing. You know, yeah. did you have a clear sense of what you wanted to do, or you were kind of just feeling as we, as you went uh, went along? Do you know what? I had no idea. I was kind of just going for, looking for opportunities. I wasn't. I didn't have any grand scheme in my mind, really. So I, I was just basically <laughs> taking a bit of whatever came along, yeah. So I was, I had, I had no idea. I had no idea what was out there, really. Uh, um, I'm curious to know about like what your, what you see your job is nowadays. Like what do you think the job is as a, as a player? Um, and because I, like from my experience, I work with large groups of people who I, who I kind of am, fr am friendly with, but I wouldn't say I have any friends among them, if you know what I mean. So but you work with a smaller group of people, and I'm curious to know, do you regard the people in the band quartet, or even you know, if you've got guest players, as you will yeah. have in your, yeah. in your upcoming concerts, are they colleagues, or are they friends, or are they both? Do you socialize? I think th these are They're, they're family. I mean, they're family. you know what I mean? And you know what families are like, so. <laughs> It's exactly yes. like family. Yeah. So uh, they've helped me out of difficult times. They've, you know, they've supported me when you know things weren't great, and likewise, you know, we'd we'd support each other if things were really bad. That's amazing. So so the, yeah, it's just like a family. So uh, good and bad. Good and bad. Yeah, <laughs> because we like this. It's like I can because I'm kind of immersed in the world of, let's say, we're going to call it classical music, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, but I also have a, a, a keen interest in rock music and the forms of music. You know, we, there's a mm. huge amount of documented evidence about how rock bands get on and don't get on and fall out and all that. You know, it, it must be the same with string quartets. And yeah, absolutely. Um, my previous one wasn't as family orientated. <laughs> and like this, um, this was fascinating for me. Like, do you know when you meet people that this is gonna? Do you can you tell within six months of forming a quartet that this is going to be very family orientated, to use your phrase, <laughs> or does it kind of evolve a certain way? And I'm curious about that. I th I think. Well, I suppose I can only talk about my own experience. So um, I think when you're younger, it's more difficult to behave like you're in a family. Because you want to escape your family, you want to actually grow up and, and uh, get into the big bad world and be independent. But when you're more mature, I think you actually like that aspect of the, the nature of the beast. And so I think you grow to appreciate the good sides of it rather than see the negative side. And like all relationships, they require work. Totally, yeah. And then I assume, maybe I'm wrong to assume this, that, you know, if the relationship, as you call it, the family relationship in the group develops to an extent, that as things go on, you, first of all, have heightened amount of trust for each other and what the other person does. But I presume less has to be said. Or <coughs> yeah. Is that right? Is that yeah, wrong? a is raising that... of the eyebrow does quite a lot <laughs> okay. the older you get. It's, um... And, you know, yes, of course, you can have, you get to know people's slight movements, what they mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Their tics. What, like, yeah, like that can mean, what are you doing? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, because it, it, it is what, quite simple. I mean, I know, I know from even conducting an orchestra, and I know a particular player. Yeah, will just do something like this, and I'll go, no. oh, "There's a problem oh, there, oh, like, whatever." You know, and I mean, I, what is that? You know, yeah, that must be interesting. Um, talk a little bit about the program for the oh. concert. So you've two pieces on the program. You've got Vorjak Sextet. Vorjak Sextet, which is kind of rarity. It's not often performed. Um, that was kind of a middle, when he was starting to get well known actually, you know, he's a late, late starter, Dvorak. Yeah. Um, and, and of course he's bohemian, which is a great contrast to the Brahms, which is more Germanic or Teutonic, if you want to call it that. That's the Brahms Quintet in the F. The Brahms Quintet, yeah, 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 in F. And it's the first of two Brahms Quintets. So, yeah. and it's, it's an unusual one, also not often performed. You, they usually do the second, yeah. The second one's programmed more often anyway than the first, first one. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the Vorjak Sextet, I, 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 I love Vorjak. I mean, if you, had to, if you said to me, Desert Island, will you take Dvorak or Brahms? Yeah. I'd say Vorjak. Really? No, okay. problem. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Even though Brahms wrote fabulous chamber music, symphonies, everything. Yeah. Have you played both works before? Yeah. OK, yeah. so you know them well. Yeah. How much work do you do beforehand with the score? Um, so a fair, a for fair people who bit. don't know, like yeah. you obviously yeah. have your part, yeah. but there will be a score as well. We can sort of everyone else's yeah, part. Yeah, a fair, fair bit, because I like scores. I think I've always liked scores. Um, and especially wherever in contemporary music, I tend to like to use the score mm. if I can, if there's enough space to read my, my, my part. It, it, I think it helps, you know, cohesion. It also helps you understand the music better, basically. It's a map. <laughs> you know, yeah. If you've only got one road on the map, yeah. then, you know, you, <laughs> you're going to walk in a certain direction and that's, uh, you're not going to notice what's, what's all around you, you know, so. It's and a, does everybody else in the quartet, they work with scores, does everyone work with scores or is there some people who just know, like to do their own thing? Or? What we'd do is, there'd always be someone with a score, so yeah. if there's a dispute of something or, and let's say an anomaly. Yes. <laughs> um, we can we can have a you know heated debate about it, cool. and uh, which are always good fun anyway. Yeah. You, know, you can end up arguing about the stupidest things of you course. Know, in the I world. Know. Yeah. Cool. Um, and um, what's the difference when you know? Let's say because you've you've got some guest players with you. Yes. For the upcoming performance. Yes, because. Um, we had it's right, the sextet, um, we have to we need an extra cello and extra viola, and the quintet we need an extra just the extra viola, that's right. So it's David Kenny uh from the Construct great, yeah. um on viola and uh Isolt Cooper Stockdale who's the tennis player, second cello. Yeah, great. Yeah. And Liz Charlson who's also uh playing with us uh, violin, yeah. Uh, so what's the difference in a dynamic when you have this, let's refer to it as this, these infiltrators who come into the quartet. You <laughs> it's know, a good word, I like play. that. Yeah, who, um, <laughs> it's always much easier and much happier and, and less arguments. Really? To, oh yeah, it's like, Is there, like everyone has to be on their best behavior. It's like the family's <laughs> invited <laughs> guests for tea. I love it. And everyone's uh, being ever so nice. Oh yes, 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 that's yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's amazing. Except it depends if you get guests who come frequently and then they get to know the real, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to know, if you want to know, you come and live with me. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. <laughs> so it's a bit like that. Um, so this is like a question that I just, it's a general question I ask kind of almost any musician I talk to, you know, when you perform, how often do you take risks? And what are these risks for people who, mm. who just see you play a quartet or a quartet mm. or a sextet? They, they just, they hear you play and they just see you play. But I know from my experience that like, Every, like every second, you've got lots of quick choices to make, but lots of different things, you're reacting to things going on around you. And while it looks like you're kind of playing something that you've rehearsed, and it's kind of a little bit, yeah. it looks like you, you're doing something that you know what you're doing, but there's lots of things that's gonna happen in the next three or four bars you don't quite know yet. And within those bars, you've gotta make decisions. Some of them will involve questioning whether I take a risk here or not. Yeah. So how often do you take risks and what are those risks? Probably more frequently than people realise, I think. Yeah. Um, That's why I'm asking the question. And they usually entail maybe a, 
change of fingering or bowing, and you're thinking, that fingering never worked anyway. And then finally, when the heat is on, you go, why didn't I just use this fingering? Yeah, all the time, or this bowing, or whatever. It's usually that kind of thing. Or, you know, that, that, that's a sort of risking. And are you aware at times that maybe in a quartet or a small chamber music ensemble, that a risk you might take would have a big impact on somebody else in the group or the rest of the ensemble. Like, for example, I'm thinking particularly of tempo or articulation or something, a balance or something as well, that if you took a risk on something, everyone else would kind of go, oh, we all have to maybe shift the sounds a little bit. Like, what, how, does, how does that dynamic work mid-concert? Um, well, it can, it can actually liven things up a bit, you know? Can actually Why inject. would you? This is. A, I'm delighted you said that because <laughs> it's part of my life, obviously as well. Yeah. Why would you want to liven things up? A bit? Well, I suppose it adds, a, injects a bit of fuel, like fuel injection, mm. you know, into the car. It's, it's like if, it, if it's all, if it's if you play exactly as you play in a rehearsal, then it's going to sound pretty boring and sort of flat and without any energy, I suppose. And the, I think it's, it's, I think the adrenaline really maybe is, is the best drug we have, you know, uh, it kind of, well, it saves our life for a start <laughs> crossing the road. But when we, when we have it in a concert, it, 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 it also gives us some kind of extra gear, which uh, I uh, haven't figured out why it does that, but it, it, you can't escape it, it's there. And it, 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 it's uh, vital, I think, it's vital, yeah. you know. It is. Um, so we're slowly getting vaccinated now, one by one. We're getting our jabs. Have you any hopes or wishes or desires for what happens after the pandemic, even personally, but broadly mm. speaking, about the world? Or? Well, um, it's easy to look at the negative side of things and, and think, well, will, will our profession ever return to normality? Um, on the other hand, you know, this profession has survived world wars. It survived um, all sorts of catastrophes. You know, it, it's 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 one of those things that just survives. And I think musicians. I mean, we, we wouldn't we we wouldn't get into it for the money. <laughs> so it's it's obviously um, something that we passionately have to do. So it's not as if it's, we're going to say, oh, well, it's too dangerous to be a musician anymore. So I think what's going to happen is it's going to be, we're going to find ways of working around it. And even, you know, it's not ideal playing to no audience at all, far from it. But it's getting us out there doing it. And I think, you know, it, it, we have to look at it positively, I think. And I, I, I do feel positive about, about the future, yes, I do. You exude that positivity, and it's it's really great. It's a great thing to witness. And the last question then. So from yourself personally, um, are there any unrealized ambitions that Keith Pascoe, <laughs> beyond learning <laughs> Arabic and becoming <laughs> fluent in Arabic, you know? But musically, are there any things that you, you know, you've got this burning desire for the past, like, two or three decades, I really want to play this piece or do this or play somewhere or go somewhere. What are your, what, what, what drives you into the future in terms of ambition? I think um, there's so many pieces in the, in the chamber music repertoire that, you know, two lives wouldn't be enough. There's certain lacunae, or lacunae, how do you yeah. say that word, lacunae? Yeah. lacunae. That um, still in my repertoire, like I've never played Bartok's second quartet. It's really annoying me. It's wow. like, really is annoying me that that's this kind of things like that. Um, loads of Dvorak, loads of Beethoven. Well, no, I've played Beethoven many, many times. Um, but I love playing them again and again. Uh, ambitions to you know, just keep healthy and to, to do what I'm doing because I love it. Great. Keith, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk Likewise. to you. Likewise, thank you, uh, Dave. Very best of luck Thanks. with the performance. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thanks thank for you. talking to me.